Uh, let me see. If Hello. I... Hello, Alpha. Hi. How are you, how you doing? Um, I got a question about uh, the will process. Uh, if if they don't take it at the county recorder, or they don't accept it, how how are we going to get this will on the public record once we've prepared it, and we've appointed ourselves as a general guardian, general executor of the, the legal fiction, you know, of the name of the person? Great, how are we great going to question. Get that on the... um, I would say. There's, there's, there's two things I want to be very careful about this. The, the reason that the, and I want to qualify the county recorder because I didn't cover this point earlier. The reference to domicile, uh, domicile is actually in reference to the domicile of the estate. And in most cases, the domicile of the estate is the same place that we were born. And the reason that I believe the recording of the existence of the will is so relevant to the court roles, to the county recorder, is that it has a tangible influence then on land records. It is effectively like um, a lien or an amendment against uh, a piece of land because it is all land. If the county recorder, if the lands department will not accept the recording of a public record, then I would suggest that we need to uh, go for a public record uh, elsewhere, uh, such as a non-UCC filing, which is a form of public record, such as a gazetting of of uh, public notice, which is also a form of public record, and then refer that to the uh, equivalent Secretary of State or, or another uh, Attorney General, uh, where we uh, then effectively seek to force the county to recognise that uh, it is already on the public record and that they are failing to do their duty. I, I'm. It's a long-winded answer. I know that it's a long-winded answer, Alpha 999, but uh, I, I have a feeling that not all public record is the same in this case and that we really, really want to get it with either the lands department or with the uh, county recorder. Uh, but I, I haven't, I'm not convinced we have a, a, a right formula yet. We're still exploring what's going on with these recorders. And uh, so far, we're seeing that their, their knowledge of this subject is extremely poor. So I'm not convinced we've, we've kind of come to a, either a, uh, an impasse or a solution yet. But did, did you... Buddy, yeah. buddy, a couple of years, a year and a half ago, I went through, you know, as I was doing some research on you know, Freeman on the land and the sort, you know, uh, notice of understanding and claims of rights and so forth. What I did was on the claim of right, I, I, I did post on the top of it I just said this will be posted at the uh, the courthouse at whatever address I wonder if that on this on this subject ha adds anything to the public record if we just post it or just post it right at the right at the courthouse look I think um, this is what I think we need to do there is a lot of kind of romantic mythology around these things would you agree Mm-hmm. Yes. We ha and, and we need to distinguish what is still effectively statute in force and what is no longer active and what is completely Wait. mythology. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we need to be forensic. Okay, the, the the corporate and this is this is an answer. Again, sorry for this long winded, but you the subject you raise is is triggered a number of things that I think are important to say on the broadcast tonight. The corporate service that has overlaid and usurped the estate procedure cannot exist without the underlying legal fiction and statute that encloses the right. In other words, if the underlying 
clause or the underlying statute were to be removed, then the corporate code would have no effect. That is a very, very important point to make. Okay? So any corporate service that they've made absolutely depends that there is some underlying statute still in effect. Okay? Right. We've just got to find those underlying statutes. And I think we've got to be forensic. We've got to be unemotional. We've got to leave at the door all the things that people have said to us and just look at it on face value. And if we do that, I think we'll find in each state very quickly exactly the, the, the state of, of affairs. And that will then give us the guidance as to what they are still permitting or not permitting. Okay? Well, what you're saying, but basically, I'm, what I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, what you're saying is if we go in and, you know, we got, obviously there's, there's matters that are before the courts right now. If we go in and yep. say, hey, I'm the, I'm the occupant of the office of the executor or the general guardian, the general executor, um, that, that does have some effect. It just doesn't have the same force and effect as if we've got these documents backing us up. Correct, correct. Or are, they, just completely, are they completely useless to say? I mean, that might get us <clears throat> get us somewhere with some judge. Well, it's yeah. going to have a huge effect when you when you perfect yeah. it, and it's going to have even oh, bigger effect. Right when, yeah, yeah. When, when you appoint a uh, an administrator to act on your behalf. Well, look, let's keep going. Thank you. I, I hope. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't give a, a definitive and a short <laughs> and a clear no, answer. Problem. Yeah, that's well, thank, thank you very much. Good on you. Look, that was a great question, and, and you saw a number of things came out of it. And uh, if I if I don't know, uh, and there's not information to add, I just simply say I don't know. But uh, I thought there's some important points there. Look, um, Silver Thirty Eight asked another question before we go to the next caller, and please, I'd love to hear from you. I know that we see Ron that's there. If any of you want to uh, come on, please uh, press star eight hash eight, and I'd love to hear from you. Uh, Silver Thirty Eight says, look, uh, if within the will uh, it were disclosed to bequeath or value monetary and the like to the beneficiary named in the will, would that not uh, be entitled to the heir of the estate? Um, there are a number of things in the uh, structure of the will. Firstly, a will is a form defined by Roman statute when we are referring to a will. We could call a will... Uh, we could call a form a will and it could be according to our own rules. So everything I'm talking about when we talk about a will and a testament is a form defined by Roman statute beginning with the Wills Act of 1837. So how it is structured, how it works, is wholly defined by statute and not subject to any claim of Roman common law or any other kind of... Uh, uh, maxim, uh, it is its performance is is wholly within that. So, within that, a, a will must be in writing. Uh, a, a we are not permitted to uh, deprive our, our spouse. Um, in the uh, maxims that they state, um, that the statute states at least, uh, we can we can nominate our uh, beneficiaries are kin and the heirs and successors and it has, a, has a, an effect but also uh, the thing that they do for us is that we are treated as a pauper as a peon and that in many cases the presumption if we do ultimately have a will accepted and remember they're not accepting wills at the moment they're, they're claiming that everyone must go through probate so that's saying that none of us are granted the right under their procedure because they're tricking us that uh, we have a valid will. All we have is a claim against our estate. But they also say that our estates are per otro v, which is a fancy French way of saying a life estate. So they're not even necessarily uh, granting us that our estate contains anything like fee, simple, absolute, or any higher right. They're simply, they're simply saying under the Wills Act that our uh, estates, in many cases, are the estates of the lowest of the low. So, um, 
in that case we are limited with what we the effect of our intent so I think it's worth and it is definitely worth us as we get more knowledge on exactly what they're doing here uh, to be clear on the limits they're claiming and to this end I, the reason also it's taking time to prepare the will and testament is to see how we can establish that instrument without falling into the presumptions that we are that kind of peon. I'll give an example. Non-resident alien we've established is a foreign to the corporate topography of the corporate uh, overlay of the estate. So it's very important that in our will and testament we don't sit and identify ourselves as a resident, for example, of Sydney, which immediately puts us uh, as uh, the property of the corporation. So it's very subtle, but it's very important that we stay within the boundaries of the statute if we're preparing a form, a Roman cult form, and secondly, to what degree we can make it clear that we are not uh, a peon, that we are uh, of the highest form in their system. That's not clear yet, and I look forward to us getting that done. Look, I've, uh, I, I, my answers are still far too long, but hopefully I can speak a bit clearer now with uh, Ron. Ron's on the line, and Ron can you hear us. Hi, Frank. Hi. Hey, would you mind if I read some definitions out of the Corpus Juris Secundum, and it relates to estates and absence and stuff like that? Sure, please. I'll, I'll do it for about five minutes, and then we'll talk a little bit about it, and then I'll get off, because I have a bunch of them. We need to, like... Put this whole thing together so people understand the total concept of what they're doing to us. Yep. So the the definition of a state of a deceased person is not a legal entity, but is merely a name indicating the sum total of the decedent's assets and liabilities, and is not an entity known to the law, and is not a natural or artificial person, but is merely a name the sum total of the assets. A state is generally used as meaning property belonging to a decedent, a ward, a mentally incompetent person, or a bankrupt in which is being administered in the courts. Then, this is where it gets really strange, and you can tie this in with the domicile of the estate, which happens to be the same name. The name of the estate is your name in all capital letters. It's We used to refer to it as the straw man, but really it's the name of the estate. Yep. Okay. This is an, uh, a definition for absence. Um, fact of death. Death of the person on whose estate administration is sought is a jurisdiction requisite. And while the presumption of death arising from absence may present a prima facie case sufficient to warrant a grant of administration, yet if subsequently develops that such person was in fact alive, the administration is void. There's another part in here that talks about it doesn't care, it doesn't matter if you are alive or dead they're going to administrate the estate. <laughs> really, it says right here, production of body is not required to prove death in a civil matter, such as the appointment of an administrator. That's a that's a good one. <laughs> let's um before people's heads explode, Ron. <laughs> let's I mean because I know there's a lot there. Can we do this? Send the rest of the definition through to to Lynn. She oh, can she incorporate has. them. Yeah, she can incorporate them into the to the synopsis of the call. But can we just cover a couple of those things sure. that you've raised? Because I think they're all valid. Um, if you look at blacks, you can actually see, once you get a measure for what they're doing, for example, how long, and I put this to you, Ron, how long have we journeyed to try and establish the zero point of when the corporations took over from the estate? Oh. How long? For me, it's been 15, 16 years. Right. And you've heard everyone from, you know, year zero was 1871 with the District of Columbia, right? Yep, yep. 
and others have said, no, it's 1801 with your...